of our everything. You're worthy of our commitment. You're worthy of our priorities. You're worthy of our thoughts. You're worthy to be center of our relationships, of our career, of our finances, of our hobbies. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. We love you. Thank you for your presence among us today. Thank you for the truths of your word and the activity of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray now that you'll receive this offering as an act of worship. We bring it to your praise and honor that the gospel of Christ might go to the nations. In his name we pray. Jesus Christ, the highest one. Amen. You may be seated. All right. This is our regular offering. All right. The special offering for the chapel renovations will be after the message. So this is our regular offering. Just want to make that real clear. The other one will be later. Welcome. Good to have you today. Turn in, the, in your Bibles to the book of Hosea. We have two praises to bring, and then I'll dismiss the children. Two little babies came into the body of living hope this week. Yeah. The Brooks had a baby girl, and the Marchettis had a baby girl. So there's Esther Brooks, and Joshua was on the worship team today. How about that? Yeah. And then the Marchettis had a little girl. Check that out. Rushing, and Rachel had Vivian Luis. So are the Marchettis here? Grant? Oh, you are. Awesome. They're good to have y'all. Awesome. Gip, how's it feel, brother? Grand, granddad. <laughs> All right. Children ages three years to fifth grade that wish to go to the Gospel Project time, you're dismissed. If you need a Bible today, there's some in the back. Right by Julia, wave your hand. You can go back there and grab one. And it's on page 515 in this Bible. I really want you to have a Bible uh, in your hand, in your lap, because today we're going to just go verse by verse through th 13 verses of chapter 2 in Hosea. So finger in the text, heart open to God, pen ready to write what God says. All right, you with me? Finger in the text, heart open to God, pen ready to write what God says to you. I know we've prayed several times, but uh, can we pray again? Just pause right now. Um, I don't know why I, I just really come with a heavy heart today. Um, I think it's because of just what this date represents in the history of our nation, but also what we're going to see in the text today. This is a heavy passage, folks. This is, this is one of those that when you preach verse by verse, chapter by chapter through books of the Bible, you can't just skip over stuff that's kind of heavy. And um, I just really feel a, a real need, extra, extra grace required on David Holt today. So could you uh, join me in prayer? Lord, I ask your Holy Spirit to please anoint this time. Feeling extremely emotional, God. And help me just to be in your spirit right now and, and preach this the way you would want it. I mean, maybe this is from you. I don't know, but I just really, I don't want to be in the flesh. I don't want to, I just want to be so locked into your spirit that we hear from heaven and we are changed today. God, would you give us your heart and would you also give us your mind? We need to, to think rightly about sin but we also need to have your heart, your merciful, gracious heart about sin and what it'll do if we stay in it, but how we can be brought out of it. And just let Jesus and the gospel even shine forth from this book written in 700 plus B.C. God, your word is true. All scriptures inspired by God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, that we might be adequate, equipped for every good work. And I pray that your infallible, inerrant word will be powerfully uh, preached from your spirit, not from me as much as your spirit, 
to just take it and use it in a way that our lives will be changed and we'll gain a deeper sense of who you are and what you think of these matters. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in week three of the book of Hosea. And I hope you're using this series as an opportunity to, to share this amazing message with people. Yesterday, I was, an ev I was at an event to, to, to leave unnamed, and I'm sure you can imagine what it was, but I purposefully talked to 10 people yesterday using Hosea. And I didn't even say I'm a pastor. I just said, I go to this church, and we're going through a really interesting study right now on the book of Hosea. Have you ever heard of that book and that story? And I mean... I have yet to talk to anybody that has a clue. And then this is what I'll say. I said, it's this amazing story in the Bible. God commanding a prophet Hosea, a holy man, to marry a prostitute. And by that time, their eyes just begin to go. And he tells him that she's not going to be faithful to him. God tells Hosea. But he's to be faithful to her, to model the amazing unconditional love that God has for us because we, like Israel, commit spiritual harlotry on a regular basis. And yet God stays faithful. And not only that, but he seeks to draw us out of our sin into his righteousness. I encourage you to read that book, the book of Hosea. This week I was helping my daughter Sarah with her college history class just so happened that they were covering what is called the Gilded Age, 1870 to 1890. And then it described the Gilded Age as such. Something that is gilded is covered with gold, but underneath it's rottenness and deception. And Sarah, being the sharp daughter of mine that she is, says, that sounds like sin. Covered with gold. Looks very attractive. But like a rotten apple, anybody want to come and be a taster of this apple today? Doesn't it look good? But I could cover it with caramel syrup, and it might good, look good on the outside, and it might taste good for a season, but it wouldn't take long, would it, for you to get to that part, and it wouldn't be a pretty picture, and you wouldn't feel very good afterwards. That's what we're going to learn today in verses 1 to 13 of Hosea chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. What we have here going on is an address to the brothers and sisters, and the fact that it mentions plural in both categories, even though chapter 1 only mentioned three, but here we have possibly four, means that she could have brought other children into the picture. We talked about that a little bit last week. But the bottom line is, this reinforces what we learned last week. What a picture of the gospel of Jesus, because we go from no mercy to mercy, and from not my people to my people, and it's a declaration of grace. And it's because Jesus became no mercy for you and me, and because Jesus became not my people for you and me, that we, like these children, can get grace, can get mercy when before we had no mercy, and we can become, not, we can become his people when we'll be before we were not his people. This is the gospel right here. And so point number one is this. God loves to bring about divine reversals. And he wants to do this in your life. And my life, he wants to give some of you hope today that what has been negative in your life can become a positive if you'll allow him into it. He loves to bring about divine reversals. As we move to verse 2, we see that the divine reversal that God did with the children, and we'll see this re reinforced again in chapter 2, verse 23 next week, he wants to do with the mother, Gomer. Verse 2, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, I'm not her husband. Plead that she put away her whoring from her face. What we have here is Hosea seeking to call Gomer out of her harlotry through the children. Now, th this is not a criticism, women, of you, but sometimes... Mothers will listen more to a child than to the husband. 
<laughs> I've had many men say, I know I cut the cord, I was there. But it seems like there's this invisible attachment from child to mother. No, this is not a criticism, ladies. We have no clue what it's like to hold a baby within us for nine months, so uh, this is not a criticism. But I see Hosea seeking to get to his wife through the children. Plead with your mother. The word in Hebrew here literally means make a case in court, stating the facts. Plead with her. She's ruining her life. She's ruining our life. She's destroying this marriage. There is really no relationship. Is this a formal divorce? Maybe, because in chapter 3, we're going to see in two weeks how he has to buy her back. Regardless of whether it's a legal, formal divorce or not, there's no relationship. So he says, she's not my wife. I'm not her husband. She's already gone wayward in just the first chapter and two verses of Hosea. He had married her in chapter 1, and she's already gone astray. Point two, sometimes God will pursue us through the voice of others. Some of you are here today because somebody invited you. Some of you are having people that love you say things to you, and you might be dismissing it but it very well could be the voice of God. Now, you filter everything through this. This is the only reliable, 100%, infallible, inerrant truth, word of God, and yet he often will speak and pursue us through other people. I'm so thankful for the people that shared the gospel with me. My senior year in high school that resulted in my coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Sometimes God, often God, I would almost change this point, often God will pursue us through the voice of others. The end of verse 2, that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breast. Graphic language to describe her sin. Beloved, God doesn't sugarcoat her sin and he doesn't sugarcoat our sin. Sin offends God. Sin breaks the heart of God. Sin hinders relationship with God. And God loves us so much and wants relationship with us so much that he will tell it like it is and pursue us in many different ways. In this case, through Gomer's own children. This is called tough love, my friends. And perhaps this hits home for some of you today. God's trying to get your attention. Verse 3, lest. In other words, if she doesn't repent, Here's what I'm going to do to apply pressure to her, and it's because I love her. Lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and make her, notice the repeat of make, and make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst. It's as if God is saying, I may have to expose her. I may have to break her down. I may have to let her face the raw ugliness of what she has done. Whew. I like what John Piper says on this verse. When God is treated as less than a husband, he shows that he is vastly more than a husband. In other words, he's a father, he's a king, he's a sovereign, he's holy, and he's judge. If you forsake God as husband then sometimes he'll kick in his other attributes. If you forsake God as loving husband, then he will sometimes kick in his other attributes. I've seen this many times. I've seen it this week. Sometimes sin that is done in secret all of a sudden gets exposed. What was in the dark comes to light. Numbers 32, 23 says your sin will find you out. And this is all designed to bring about repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See, worldly sorry, sorrow is I'm sorry I got caught. Godly sorry, sorrow is I'm sorry I did it and I'm going to repent. I'm sorry I offended God, not just, oh, now i got to pay a fine or 
some other earthly consequence. We see here God's father heart and God's powerful drawing heart and how God is showing love in a tough love package. You see, love can be tender, kind, and merciful and gracious. And I think that's what God desires most in the expression of his love. But when we resist that and we refuse to accept that, and we think our way's better than his, then his love comes in in what Hebrews 12 says, he disciplines those whom he loves. Tough love. Both are love, different expressions. You see, the bottom line in this section of chapter 2 is, how does God respond to waywardness? On the one hand, does he just judge it and condemn it and say, go to H-E double toothpicks, <laughs> there's no hope for you? Or does he respond, it's not a big deal. Do your best next time. Hey, I'll just grade you on the curve. He does neither. He's got that perfect, amazing blend of holiness and love, truth and mercy. Jesus modeled this. We've talked about that here a lot. The woman caught in adultery. Neither do I condemn you. That's grace. Go and sin no more. That's truth. All of this reminds me of Ezekiel 18.32. I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn and live. I, I will bring death and judgment if I have to, but my real father heart, and every parent in the room knows what this is like, my real passion father heart is that you turn and live. I prefer to show mercy. I prefer to show grace. But if you continually stiff arm me and you go whoring after other lovers, then I must do this. But as I do this, you need to know that's in love because it's, it's done with the intention to drive you out of that. This is a great example, beloved, of how you must preach the whole counsel of God. And we must seek to understand the full attributes of God. You can pick and choose attributes like going to Ryan's buffet today, but, but you can't pick and choose the attributes of God. He is who he is. And your actions and your heart largely determine which aspects of his nature you will experience. Does that make sense? Spurgeon said, there are two things that surprise me the most. <laughs> Our sin that we would go away from a God who loves us and created us. And then he said the second thing was God's grace <laughs> and how he goes toward us in our sin. Wow. The end of verse 3, make her like a wilderness, parched land, kill her with thirst. What's going on here? This is where the caramel-coated rotten apple is now being tasted for what it is. The wages of sin is death, and that death part is now being experienced. What promised one thing is now delivering an entirely different thing. What promised to quench the thirst has left one empty and unsatisfied and dry and parched. I have two bottles of water here. This one is good water and it could be drunk. This one we have purposely put dirt and mud in. You drink this, you'll be left thirsty. You'll be left sick. You'll be left dry. It's our choice. This is a classic case of Jeremiah chapter 2. Verse 13, my people have committed two sins. This is important. They have forsaken me, that's the one sin, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns. Cisterns were wells that held water, but they're broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Remember about a few months ago, I had the buckets up here? All these buckets that we seek to fill our lives with to give us purpose and meaning, but they're all leaky? This is a leaky cistern. Go to this well, seeking to get your needs met, it only leaves you wanting, looking for love in all the wrong places. And it will destroy your life and destroy the lives of those around you. All of a sudden, that fun party the night before, you're left with a hangover. All of a sudden, there's pregnancy that you didn't want. All of a sudden, there's now an addiction to that drug. All of a sudden, you're in jail. You're separated from your family. You're lonely. 
You've lost your job. Get the picture? Number four, point number four, the negative consequences of sin is God's way of getting our attention. Verse four. Upon her children also I will have no mercy because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. Again, this is where our actions affect others. We are not an island unto ourselves. Sins of the forefathers carry to the third and fourth generation. Parents, our children are watching. Children, your friends are watching. College students, your classmates, and others in the dorm are watching. We learn here that Gomer went back to her sinful prostitution ways. She was not a passive prostitute. Look, she was active. Verse 5, their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I'll go after my lovers. You don't go after haters. You go after who you think are going to be lovers. Who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. She probably was not that street corner prostitute that we think of in our culture, but she was a very promiscuous woman, looking for love in all the wrong places, pursuing perhaps relationships that who knows where they originated. But number five point is this, we sin because we believe it will satisfy us. We think it'll give us something. And I like what Larry Crabb says, Christian psychologist, he says, sin is seeking to get a legitimate need met from an illegitimate source. Sin is seeking to get a legitimate need met from an illegitimate source. In other words, people have affairs to try to find true love. People get drunk because they want to fit in and feel a sense of community, often with a group of people. Or people get, use drugs to cover pain and to have a sense of peace. Some become excessive workaholics or materialistic because that gives them a sense of feeling good about themselves. Usually the root of sin is rooted in a desire to have some legitimate need met. So it's important to ask yourself, why do I do this? <laughs> Why am I doing this? God, would you reveal why I'm going to this behavior? What do you go after more than God? That could be a spiritually idolatrous or adulterous relationship or thing. Gomer represents Israel and Gomer represents us. Hosea represents God. And we, like Gomer, will often go astray and commit spiritual harlotry because we believe it will satisfy. Now verse 6, very interesting verse, so listen carefully. Therefore, there are several therefores in this passage, I will hedge her, I will hedge up her way with thorns. This is where hedge of thorns comes from. Though the uh, comedian, Tim Hawkins, I think does it injustice, even though it's funny. Like Satan can't get through, like he said, well, I don't want a hedge. Satan can get through a hedge. <laughs> but it's a hedge and a wall here. I will hedge up her way with thorns. I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. What's going on here? This is cool. This again shows the tough love of God. A hedge of thorns is to prick one in their sin and make them uncomfortable in their sin so that they'll get out of their sin. It's very simple. And this is a biblical prayer, despite what Hawkins does with it. It's, it's, a, it's a biblical prayer to pray a hedge of thorns around somebody. When you know somebody who's far from God, or who's out of the will of God, or who is, who is a prodigal, so to speak, I, you, when you pray that, that, that God would bring a hedge of thorns, you're praying that difficulties, pain, if need be, always trusting God's sovereignty over it all, that God would prick them in their sin to bring them out of their sins. Does that make sense? And then he says he'll put a wall against them. So you're headed in a direction, and it's like, mm, whoa, it's not giving me what I want. I thought it would give me that. But instead, oh, it, it's a wall that you hit, to be a wake-up call. The wall is a wake-up call. 
Some of you are hitting a wall right now. God in his love and mercy and sovereignty is having you hit a wall and he's putting thorns in your life to get you out of your sin. To get you back in his will. So number six, God uses pain as a wake-up call. All of a sudden, that relationship's going awry. The drugs are leading to an addiction. The grades are headed downhill because of partying. Something wrong in your body, maybe, is that wake-up call. The anxiety and the worry, perhaps, is that wall or that hedge of thorns. And it is being brought to you because he loves you. He loves you so much that he is pursuing you through these hedges and thorns and walls. You see? He's the loving hound of heaven. And verse 7 gives us the fruit of that prayer. Therefore, I'm sorry, she shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. That word means to find them. She's pursuing it, but not getting it. <laughs> That's good, because if she got it, it's going to prolong her repentance. She shall seek them, but she shall not find them. These are the broken cisterns. Oh, and here we go. Circle it. Then, then she shall say, this is exactly like the prodigal. When he's eating pig slop, and he says, oh, it, he came to his senses. And he says, my father's servants have it better than I do. I'm going to go back. Here she says, I will go and return to my first husband. That's, go, that's Hosea. For it was better for me then than now. Some of you know exactly what this is like. You used to walk with God. You used to have a passion for God. You used to be in the Word. But you have gone away from God. And as you look back, you go, it was better for me then, now that I think of it. You're coming to your senses. You're realizing, you know, when I was walking with God, there was joy, there was peace. That I had a clear conscience. My family relations were so much better. I didn't have all this friction. What am I doing? That's what's happening here. It was better for me then than now. And then verse 8. She did not know that it was I who gave her the grain and the wine and the oil and who lavished on her silver and gold which they used for Baal. Wow. She realizes now that it was Hosea who gave her this good stuff. But what does she do? And this is where you really get the prophetic part because it's talking a lot about Israel now. That silver and gold that God blessed them with, this is almost a picture of when they came out of the, the, uh, the Egyptian slavery and then they created the Baals when Moses was gone, but it's beyond that because this has continued even in this day. And they used that for Baal worship. Wow. God gives some people musical talents and yet many use that talent to do music that does not honor him. Or the gifted artist or photographer that uses that gift to capture porn or create blasphemous movies. Or the person gifted in sales or finances, but they only create wealth for self and not to be generous. They are building bigger barns. I think of our country at this verse. On this 9-11, America, America, God shed his grace on thee. And God has done just that. And yet, what would have we done with those blessings? We've forgotten that it's his grace and goodness that's caused this country to prosper. We've extolled the greatness of democracy and free enterprise. Forgotten that God made us great. God bless the U.S. God anointed those founding fathers to write the Constitution, which we better protect, beloved. And you better vote in this election. Our nation's future is at stake. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but it is important that we learn the issues and we vote lest we lose democracy in this nation. 
Then verse 9. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season. I'll take away my wool and my flax, which were there to cover her nakedness. Here's point number seven. If we misuse what God blesses us with, He may take it away. If we misuse what God has blessed us with, He may take it away. My brother was a star gymnast at the University of Georgia in 1977, full scholarship. He wasn't walking with God. He didn't care about God. God brought a knee injury to my brother, and that's how he got saved, and now he's a pastor. If we misuse what God blesses us with, he may take it away. That doesn't mean all injuries, athletes, are judgments of God, but sometimes they are a wake-up call. Parents, you know what this is like. If you give your children an allowance and they use that money to go buy drugs and do all kinds of sinful things, are you going to keep giving them that allowance? I hope not. If you do, you're an enabler. Hello? God's the perfect parent. They were misusing his blessing, so he says, I'll take it back. Verse 8, I mean verse 9, I will take back my grain. Verse 10, now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers. Here's where what is in the secret is brought to light. No one shall rescue her out of my hand. Whoa. Sometimes God just removes the protective curtain and said, it's done. It's time. What you've been doing on the internet, what you thought no one saw, all of a sudden the spouse looks over your shoulder and sees those emails. All of a sudden the text just come up. The boss sees it. Protective hand's gone. Job over. No one shall rescue her out of my hand and I'll put an end to all her mirth. That meant gaiety or joy, celebration. Her, oh boy, look at this. Now we get religious. Her feast her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. Oh, she was religious. Oh, she went to the feast. Oh, she appeared to be a, a, a godly or, or a practicing spiritual person, but it was what Jesus said, in vain have you worshipped me. You honor me with your words, but your heart is far from me. See, people love to cover up sin with religion. Well, I go to church. Well, I'm a deacon. Well, I'm on this committee. Well, I'm a member. Well, I've been baptized. <laughs> Come on. Man looks at the outward. God looks at the heart. All her appointed feasts, verse 12, I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, these are my wages, which my lovers have given me. I I'll make them a forest. And the beast of the field shall devour them. Verse 13, I will punish her. Boy, if you want to do an interesting study, look at the I wills that Gomer says and look at the I wills that God says. God wins. Huh. I wouldn't try to outwill God. I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals. They had feasts. They went to the temple, but then they also went, they had the Baal worship. When she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry, some think this is a reference that she might have been a temple prostitute. It's not clear and went after her lovers, and here's the key, and forgot me, declares the Lord. Bottom line, forgot me. All of this, all of this resulted from forgetting the Lord, straying from that relationship with Hosea. We can name all kinds of sins here. We can stay here till the cows come home, talking about addictions and sin, and that's, there's a place for that. The bottom line, you've left the Lord. When you leave that personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, when Christ is no longer first place in your life, when you might have him as Savior, but if he's not Lord, I would question whether he's Savior, but you, you've had him as Savior, or you think you have, but he's not Lord, he's not number one, you're not a disciple of Christ, you've not denied yourself, taken up your cross and followed him, and Jesus says, then you're not one of mine. And so all this fruit stuff <laughs> is a result of the root issue. The fruit is a result of the root, and the root issue is love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
And the good news of the gospel, and this is the final point today, is only Jesus can ultimately satisfy and meet our deepest needs. So the good news is the gospel brings forgiveness. The gospel brings healing. No matter what you've done, how long you've done it, no matter where you've come from today, no matter what sin is in your life, whether I've named it today or not, it doesn't matter. Because it was all paid for at the cross. Jesus ate the rotten apple for you and me. He took the judgment of God for you and me. Jesus became no mercy when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus became not my people that we might receive mercy and become his people. That's the gospel. That is the good news that is offered you today. And it's your decision whether you forsake your other lovers and pursue Jesus. It's your decision whether you will repent and place your faith in Christ alone for your redemption, salvation, justification. He knocks at the door, but you got to open it. All right, we got time for a few questions, and then we'll conclude. So let's bring the mics around, guys. You might have a question. You might have a comment. Very brief if you do. You might want to say today, David, I've experienced exactly what you talked about. And I just want to testify that sin doesn't give you what you think it will. Maybe there's some of those. That would be cool to hear just a few 30-second spot-on testimonies. I've lived this, and I'm telling you, I'm glad I'm on the other side now. Or you may have a question. Raise your hand. Real quick. So um, you may know the passage. I was looking for it before I was going to ask it. But basically it's like when God gives us a gift, it says like he doesn't take it away or something like that. You know what I'm talking about? The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Right. So how does that gel with this? Yes. Okay. Great question. I'm impressed. Perhaps it might be better stated they can go into hiding. In other words, it's the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, I believe, is that he, he does give certain spiritual gifts and like a calling, you know, a calling to, to, to a certain vocation. He will not remove that, but you, by your sin, can inhibit the experience of those gifts or calling. So I think the gifts and the calling are different than what we saw here, which were blessings. Blessings that came that he removed temporarily, permanently, if have to, in order to bring that person into an awareness that those blessings were from him and to get them right back with God. So I think the gifts and the calling are different than the blessings of the wool, the flax, the silver and gold that's talked about here. Thank you. Great question. Andy, did you have something, or are you just stretching your legs? No, I, I, no, I, was, I was thinking the same question. I think that's Romans eleven twenty nine. I'm, I'm not sure. Romans eleven twenty nine. I think the Good. blessings would be like a, a, like you get a new car, or the Lord blesses yep. you with something along that line. Yep. The gifts would be the spiritual gifts, and the Good. calling would be what you'd be called to do. Good. Yes, sir. What I had to add to that, I know, is the blessings that God gives you if you misuse them in a way, you know, that will, um, uh, will make him feel sad. You know, yes. He will definitely will take it away. Yes. He will definitely take it away because I'm a judge of that. Mm. You know? So if we, misuse the, if we misuse the blessings, it saddens his heart. Yeah. And he will take them yeah. away. And, 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 and he, he will punish you, you know, uh, you know, for you to go through certain things, you know, that... I prefer, you know, by the way, I prefer the word discipline, yeah, discipline than punish. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus bore the punishment for our sins. Discipline mm -hmm. is what he does in, in Hebrews 12 because he loves us. Yeah. He, he will discipline you, you know, uh, 
uh, just to show you that he's there you know, for you, you know, and for you not just you know, depend on yourself, but at the same time to be able to uh, use you know, the blessing that he has given you, not just for yourself, but to uh, uh, bless others too. Amen. To share with others. Good word, brother. Amen. In the back, and then over here. Actually, I've... Jimmy, if you can go over to... Over here. Thanks. Lucius? Oh, yes. Uh, you mentioned hedging, and the hedging in that context was negative. Is there also not, in Job, a hedging that is very positive? Hedge of protection. Can you talk about that? Good, yeah. Hedge of protection, which God can remove, <laughs> in the same way that he bring a hedge of thorn. Hedge of protection is hedging us with his protective hand, his gracious hand. That's a great prayer to pray when you travel. Just pray a hedge of protection. Pray that you would surround us with your angels, surround us with your grace, guide and keep us, and help us stay alert. That's a, that, I think that's a biblical prayer. Good. Okay. Uh, Pastor David, uh, you know, um, this goes back, I guess, to the first question, uh, maybe, but uh, you know how in some denominationals and, you know, doctrines, uh, the dispensation of the gifts so, or so forth, uh, like certain gifts are no longer uh, in use today uh, because they've been, uh, I don't, disposed of, I'm not sure. Uh, and do you know what basis that is on and does it have anything to do with uh, what we're talking about here. It's really not related to the topic today. However, I will say that the only passage that cessationists use to say that we're in a different dispensation, gifts like healing tongues and prophecy are no longer valid, which I 100% disagree with. They take a verse out of 1 Corinthians 13, tongues will cease, prophecy will cease, but it's clear in the context they'll cease when Christ returns because it says when we see him face to face. Interesting, they'll never say knowledge will cease because they love to teach and talk about you know, they love to talk and teach. So they'll never take the other one there that knowledge will cease, even though it says it will. It'll, that's referring to the return of Christ, not after the closing of the New Testament canon. So at what point do you, like, claim Romans 1 and Matthew 18 and kind of, like Gomer, you kind of expose somebody's sins? Because there's probably several people in the congregation who are wondering, like, hey, well, there's this person... So in today's context, yeah. what would you advise? Well, Romans 1 talks about God gives them over, and so God exposes the sin. But there is a place for biblical church discipline and a brother confronting another brother. If you see a brother in sin, you go and show him his fault, Matthew 18, 15 to 18. And so then you seek to resolve it. If they've sinned against you or you see something in a person's life, we're called to be that kind of body. It's not talked about much today, but it's got to be done in love. It's got to be done with a weeping heart. Uh, and, and, and so, yes, there's a place for you see a brother in sin, you go in love, and you say, man, I love you, brother. What are you doing? That's what he's doing through the children here. He's, he's doing it through, you know, plead with your mother. Uh, I think Hosea had already done that, and it was falling on deaf ears. And so now he's trying a different strategy. Um, and so if it's, then if they don't repent, it says you bring two or more, especially if they're witnesses that every fact may be confirmed, then you bring it to the church leadership. So that's a New Testament church. And they did it in Corinthians. They removed a guy from their fellowship because he was having illicit relationships with a woman. But then in 2 Corinthians, he says, restore such a one. So we believe he repented. And so it's cool because there's repentance. And then he says, welcome him back. He's been under enough punishment. <laughs> Welcome him back into the fellowship. All right, one more. This Mr. is good. Mr. You guys are amazing. I love these questions. And this ties in with that. Um, I've heard before the teaching about um, sin being an illegitimate way to meet a legitimate need and also the root and the fruit. And the way it was um, taught to us was that all of our sin, there's different fruit, but it's all the same root. Good. And when you're going to approach someone with sin, that has really mm. helped me um, check myself if I'm having a judgmental attitude. Because a lot of times, especially if they're not in Christ, we want to quibble with them about mm. the fruit mm. without really dealing with the root first. Yeah. And if you talk with someone who's in sin, active in sin, but they don't know Jesus, even if they stop that sin, 
they're still apart from Christ. Wow. Because um, they could so, stop the sin and fall into self-righteousness right, right. if they're not dealing with the root. And, um, That's good. Your fruit might be materialism or, or drinking or whatever. Someone else's fruit might be something that you think is worse, you know, homosexuality or something perverse. Um, but uh, same root, different fruit. Man, that's great. Thank you. Great book. That, that reminds me of Prodigal God by Tim Keller because he talks about it. It's, we just think of the prodigal of the one who went and sinned openly, but the older brother was just as much a prodigal because he thought he was entitled to something from the father because of his dutifulness, and he was in the sin of self-righteousness that he needed to repent of. That was just as much a prodigal. Pastor Dave, you got time for one more to James Beer. All right. Only because, Only because it's James. Only because it's James. I was going to ask, earlier in the sermon, um, the Second Corinthians passage said that godly sorrow leaves no regret. So I was going to ask if you could explain that a little bit. Oh, man. That's sometimes a... it can be really hard to think about things that you've done. All right. I'm an about to preach a second sermon right now, man. That is an awesome question. The reason repentance can lead to no regret is because after you get the conviction of sin, you repent, you get the conviction of righteousness. And that's what some of you need to hear. That's what Ann Clements' prophetic word was about. Quit believing the lies about your past. If you've brought it to the cross, it's forgiven. It's forgotten. It's cleansed. You're righteous in Jesus. And so, okay, there is, James, there is a sense in your flesh, and this isn't bad flesh, that you look back and you go, yeah, I regretted that I did that. Okay, that's not what it's talking about. You still have that sense of, man, I wish I hadn't done that. What an idiot I was, blah, 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 blah. Look at all the harm I caused. But, but that's different than I think the regret that's talked about there. The regret there is that there's no shame before God anymore. Okay? You are cleansed. You're forgiven. And so you don't have to have this sense of, well, I'm so unworthy. You know, I'm such a terrible person. If you brought it to the cross, bring it there and leave it there. Don't take it back. Because it was paid for. Man, that is a great question. Good question. All right, I want to bring up the C.S. Lewis quote. And this is what we'll, we'll end the message with. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. Jesus said, come to me. I've got living water. I've got living water. Lord, thank you for your holy word. I pray that you would take what we have done and said and looked at today and that your spirit would cause it to bear fruit for the glory of Jesus. God, that we would be a people who pursue Jesus with a holy passion, so much so that those things that we used to be attracted to, we won't even be as attracted to anymore. Yes, there'll still be temptations, and yes, there'll still be the allurement of sin, and the enemy will continually come at us to steal, kill, and destroy. But, oh, God, that you would give us a passion for you where we would drink from your word and drink from your spirit so abundantly that these other things would not have an appeal to us. God, would you grant repentance today to any here? Some of you need to receive Jesus. Call upon the name of the Lord. You shall be saved. Some of you have, you used to follow God and you don't anymore. Or you've let your relationship get lukewarm. Other passions have come in and stolen your first love. Return to your first love whatever the state today. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Whether you come down to the front here and kneel, whether you go to somebody on the sides to pray, whether you stay in your seat, it doesn't matter. Your heart is what matters. But do not not respond. Respond to the word that he has planted in your spirit today. God, would you now have control over this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Prayer team, if you'd be available along the sides, the altar's open. Respond as God leads you.